Welcome back to Black Ops. I'm Emma Gatti and I'm picking up the host chair from the great Ralf Tiller. Black Op is the special web series by Space Watch Global focused on security and defense in space. It's the right place to be if you want to engage in in-depth analysis and discussions about the well-known link between space assets and military operations. It's probably the closest you will ever get to a proper James Bond plot. It is a Wednesday afternoon, it's 4 p.m. in Central Europe, and it's time for another episode of our Space Cafe Black Ops by Dr. Amagati. As always, we really appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback as we will learn and improve based on that. I'm Thorsten Kreening, publisher at SpaceWatch.Global, and we are a Europe-based online platform for information in it about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters that showed their commitment to keep our independent journalism alive. We really appreciate that. In case you want to join the supporter team, be aware it's just a click away on our website and easy to find. I know many of you are familiar with our website, our bi-weekly or daily newsletters and the Space Cafe podcast. So don't miss the latest episodes um, featuring Alexander Leindecker and Egbert Edelbrock about sex in space, the untapped conversation. But it's honest conversation about what are we doing when we are on another planet, on another uh, location where we want to settle uh, us uh, again. So we have to reproduce. So we also have new episodes in our Space Cafe radios, for instance, with Stuart Bain of North Star from the World Satellite Business Week in Paris and with Haji Napia, the DG of the Malaysia Space Agency. And that was recorded at Lima 23 in Malaysia. You can find your audio series wherever you get your podcasts from or on our website. And if you want to become a space watcher and let the world know about it with your cool t-shirt or your mugs, visit our fan shop. It's open on our website and in case, You've missed any of our previous web talks. We have an archive on our web page in the events section and, of course, on YouTube. With that, my job for today is almost done. And I'm handing over to your host, to Dr. Emma Gatti, our editor in chief in Milano. Enjoy the talk. Emma, over. Thank you, Thorsten. Thank you very much. Hello, Space Watchers. Welcome. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where your place in the world. I saw people from the US, people from India. So just uh, have a fantastic day. Thank you to be back uh, uh, on our platform. This is a new episode of Black Ops after the summer break. And uh, this is our geopolitical series where we analyze the space domain in relation to the political climate. And this is our fifth episode with our resident guest, Dr. Namrata Goswami. Uh, good morning, Namrata. How are you doing? How was the summer? Uh, good, good afternoon, Emma, and good morning, good evening to everyone. The summer was good. I had a good uh, break, and so glad to be back. Fantastic. So for those of you that don't know Namrata, first of all, this is very bad because this is already our fifth episode. So I hope you're not tuning in only today. But just in case, Namrata is a very well-known independent scholar teaching and researching space policy, geopolitics, and in general, great power competition. So she's just right, the right person for the job. She's also a faculty associate at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at the Arizona State University for the Executive Masters in Global Management Space course. She's also a consultant for Space Found Intelligence and a guest lecturer at the seminar on India Today Economic politics, innovation, and sustainability by the Emory University. And last but not least, she is also the author of one of my favorite books of the subject. It's called Scramble for the Skies, the Great Power Competition to Control the Resources of Other Space, a book that I warmly, warmly recommend to anyone interested in the topic. So just a quick summary for the last episode before we just start with the new episode. During episode four, if you remember, in June, we discussed Russia and Japan. 
capable partners in different space orders. We discussed together, Namrat and I, the different approach the two countries uh, used for space politics, the sort of like descent curve of Russia, while the rise and enthusiasm of Japan, especially when it comes to commercial space. So in case you have any doubts, just go to see the uh, recent episode, episode four, that was focused on Russia and Japan. But today we're focusing on, I would say, a topic of, that certainly Namrata knows very well. So it's going to be a bit difficult for me because she's already excellently prepared on any topic. But I suppose today she will be even uh, more prepared because today is about India, of course. The title of, uh, of our, um, the, the center of the episode is actually about, uh, about India. So Namrata, I uh, do not want to steal any more time, but so let's just uh, start from the events of this summer. India had an incredibly exciting summer when it comes to space. They landed the first rover on the moon. They hosted the BRICS G20. They published an updated new space policy. So we really have plenty uh, to, to talk today. Let's maybe start from the most uh, um, exciting event, which was the landing on Chandrayaan-3 on the South Pole. Uh, maybe you can help us to understand how this event is so important, how is moving the global equilibrium, the powers, and what is maybe India really trying to achieve uh, on the moon. Over to you. Yeah, sure, Emma. Thank you for having me again. And it's a great honor. And thank you for that question. So if you look at the Chandrayaan-3 mission, uh, there are actually some very critical uh, insights we can draw. One is that India had attempted to land uh, close to the south pole of the moon in 2019 as well with the Chandrayaan-2. And at that time, as we remember in the last few seconds, the lander hard landed, which is that it crashed on the lunar surface. And the same, the name, the rover has the same name at that time, Pragyan, was lost, right? And so fast forward to 2023, the most important insight we get from this successful landing is that India learned lessons from that failure. One was that the thruster has to be at the correct momentum, the propulsion system has to work. And what was uh, interesting was that the Indian Space Research Organization uh, put out uh, pre-landing briefs that said that they were built on a mission to fail. So they had accounted for all kinds of failure. So the biggest achievement is that they clinched the soft landing uh, on the close to the South Pole of the Moon. And why is it critical in terms of technology? Because the area around the Southern Hemisphere of the Moon and close to the South Pole has lots of craters. And so you have to have your cameras working on the lander. And so that worked. Uh, second, you have to slow down your speed. And finally, you have to land safely because if you do not land safely, you might fall into a crater, right? So that was a big achievement. And then what was also interesting was that India put out the rover Pragyan very quickly. And Pragyan then uh, went and scouted the southern part of the moon for resources like water ice, confirmed the presence of sulfur and other elements. So. The fast forward to where is India going in terms of their programs today, I think the next mission will be to collaborate with Japan to go to the lunar south pole this time and, and uh, scout for water ice and confirm water ice. Uh, and then India has also signed the Artemis Accords that is initiated by the US. Uh, in June of this year, and which demonstrates that India is now part of the uh, U.S. initiated framework for how the moon is going to be utilized and governed. So those are some of the insights we get from the Chandrayaan three. Fantastic. And let's move to the um, to, to July, where India has published the new space policy. Um, I, this is a long document, of course, but I was wondering if you can highlight for us, for us lazy people on the other side, uh, the, the major differences from the previous one, the highlights, and maybe if you can help us to understand which are going to be India's uh, space mission for, for the next uh, five years, for example. Sure. Um, so if you look at uh, India's space policy document that they put out this year, 
this is actually the first time that India has put out an official space policy. So before, of course, as you mentioned, there were documents put out by the Indian Space Research Organization, the Vikram Saravai Institute, uh, put out certain timelines as to where India will go and what kind of missions they will focus. For example, by 2025, the Vikram Saravai Center said that they would focus on remote sensing satellites, reusable technology, right? Uh, and also cryogenic engines, uh, indigenously built, and also a medium lift, lift rocket. So in the space policy document, what is so interesting is that for the first time, India has officially clarified what its institutional structures will be within India. So there was lack of clarity as to who makes space policy, uh, who would give licenses to private entities, how will that be regulated? So now it's very clear that the Department of Space makes the space policy, and then the Indian Space Research Organization basically would be a research and development entity. And then the InSpace and the New Space India Limited will be the organizations that will forward and uh, offer licenses and funding for India's private space actors. So in a nutshell, what the space policy document clearly signals to the world is that India has taken a major decision to completely privatize its end-to-end -end space activity. So the focus is that because of this particular policy shift, historically India's space program has been very state funded and Indian space research organization dominated. But today India has made a shift to enabling its private space sector to becoming the key actor, including manufacturing, building launch systems, satellite, uh, as well as building into national security space. I'll finally end by saying that one of the most critical insights that you get from the space policy document is India's position on what about ownership of space resources. So till now, there is no clarity internationally, including from the Outer Space Treaty, as to how are you going to regulate space mining activity, for example. There is a lot of focus on mining resources on the moon, like uh, helium-3, water ice, elements like titanium, aluminum. And the Outer Space Treaty, because it was conceptualized in 1967, did not anticipate that future. And we have talked about this earlier in your show. Absolutely. So in the in the Indian space policy document, there is a paragraph that clarifies that if an Indian citizen or a non-government entity is able to have the technology to extract resources, for example, on a celestial body, they can keep it. So this is following, as you know, Emma, with the Japan. US commercial, yeah, Japan. Uh, the U.S. Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act and Luxembourg's Acts, right, that, en that enables very similar ownership. So I think that's a really interesting position for India to take. And as you know, practice can become customary law, right, once you have a practice of such sort. My only critique of the document is that a space policy document should be much more than telling about internal bureaucratic institutional reorganization, right? That could have been one section, but should not have been the entire document. I think India did not tell the world how it is going to focus on different civilian space missions. What is the timeline of those space missions? For example, going to the moon, building satellite internet, uh, the second Mars mission, and why? Why is India building this? And then there was absolutely nothing on national security space. So... In my critique, a space policy document has to be comprehensive, and this particular document was not. Thank you, Navrata. Definitely. So before picking up on, one, on something that you said, I just wanted to go back one step and ask you this question. When you mention about the private space sector and the fact that India seems to want to move towards a sort of model that see um, a privatized sector, uh, I was wondering if you perceive that India's situation is going to be more similar to Europe or US or to China, because I remember when we discussed China, we discussed about the fact that the line that divides what is private and what is state is extremely blurry. Do you think that in India is going to have the similar situation or you think that India is going to be more uh, clearly divided? 
So if you look at India's uh, nuclear and space program, uh, they're, they're in a sense, uh, if you look at the framing, uh, very similar. So uh, while the Indian Space Research Organization and the private space actors that have been now developed, there are about 104 private space startups for civilian capability. There is a clear demarcation between civilian and military. So when you have tests like, for example, the 2019 anti-satellite weapon test called Mission Shakti that India did, it was the Defense Research and Development Organization that did it. So it's a completely different entity under the Ministry of Defense, right? Whereas the Indian Space Research Organization comes under the Department of Space, which is under the prime minister's office. So there is, unlike China, where there is civil military fusion, in India, there is a clear demarcation of what is civilian and military space institutions, very similar to what you said, Emma, like Japan and the US. So picking up on what you just say about military and defense and national security, um, we've discussed this for the US, but I think it's appropriate to also ask the same question for India. Does India has a military space policy and or a space force. So India does have a very similar institution like the US Space Force. So like the US in 2019 and the same year, India also developed the Defense Space Agency, which is under the Indian Air Force, very similar to the US Space Force, which is under the US Air Force, right? So unlike China, where the People's Liberation Army Strategic Support Force, despite the name, is an independent service. So, and which was constituted in 2015, so many years ahead, uh, India has a very similar structure to the US. So uh, at least in terms of institutional restructuring, that has happened. Uh, India, as I said before, has anti-satellite weapon. India is also developing military satellite capability dedicated to its Navy and Army. Uh, India does not have the military capacity that China has. China has about 250 uh, satellites that support military capability. India does not. India has about three. Uh, India is trying to scale that up. Um, India does have the capability to destroy another country's satellite in case their satellite structure is targeted, as with the anti-satellite test. Now, to come to your question about does India have a military space policy, it's not clear, right? So while India argues that uh, space has become a very critical component of reconnaissance, intelligence, and surveillance, especially because India has disputed borders with both China and Pakistan. And we know that uh, in the 2020 uh, China-India border crisis, the way that it was confirmed that PLA had built uh, physical structures on the Indian side of the line of actual control in the Himalayas, it was Maxar's satellite images, right? And so the thinking in India today is that the reason why India was not able to anticipate the Kargil conflict in the higher Himalayas with Pakistan was because of the failure of human intelligence. And so India needs to develop its own satellite military capability. So there is thinking. The chief of defense staff in a very recent defense symposium by the Indian Space Agency said that India should also think about developing a non-kinetic anti-satellite weapon like laser, uh, you know, laser uh, weapons, uh, ability to blind, dazzle, as well as cyber capability. But I don't see clarity in terms of uh, military space doctrine as yet. And to me, Emma, that is actually not in India's advantage, given the fact that India projects itself as a leading space power. And so you cannot be ambiguous about your, where your military space capability is going and claim that you're a leading space power. Thank you very much. That was very clear. Let's stick to the ASAT uh, um, uh, sector because you mentioned them and I actually have a question about this. Um, India's position uh, in regards of the ASAT test moratorium is a big gray 
Um, mm -hmm. We know that it did not sign the UN General Assembly resolution. I'm referring to the 7741 for records. And this is a, a resolution that supported the direct assent as a test moratorium, which aims to ban this kind of uh, a destructive kinetic test. So obviously my question is like, why do you think so? And what are the delicate uh, political balances behind this choice of India? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm very glad you asked that question because I think that's a puzzle for the world, right? On one hand, India wants to be a responsible space player, is concerned about issues of space debris management because after all, it'll impact India's own infrastructure as well. But on the other hand, at the level of the UN, India abstain from supporting, as you mentioned, uh, the US-led uh, anti-satellite moratorium. So if you look at the Indian position, and especially the position, not just on the anti-satellite uh, weapon testing moratorium, but also on the position of the open-ended working group uh, that is talking about ensuring that space does not get militarized. India's position is that these are all norm-based entities, right? So by which it means that you will offer a certain standard of behavior, but there is no legal obligation to follow it. And so the Indian position, and this is also the Global South position to an extent, that unless you have a treaty bound legal mechanism that ensures that states not only concentrate on responsible behavior, but limit their capability, you cannot be sure that nations will not engage in this activity in the future, right? So you need to have treaty-based obligation, and that is the Indian position, and to an extent also the Global South position. I say that because uh, historically the European Union tried to build the European Code of Conduct in space, and the biggest criticism that came from the developing world was that you can have code of conduct based on norms, but what happens if a developed nation decides to uh, go against- Forget it? about the norms. Yeah, uh, forget about norms, right? And do an activity that violates that. There is no legal consequence for it, right? And so, and that particular country can also come from the global south. Like for example, if a country becomes very developed, they can also violate that norm, right? So India's position is that that, that is the number one principal objection. The second objection is that when you use words like responsible, who decides? What means right? responsible? What it means and behavior. What do you mean by behavior? You know, behavior can also be very subjective. The only thing that is not subjective is capability. Like if you have a moratorium on development of anti-satellite weapon that is much more powerful than trying to stop the behavior, right? And so that is the Indian uh, legal, I think very legalistic position on why it abstain at the level of the United Nations. And I suppose it's not only a matter of uh, the fact that this treaty is not binding and by it's also the fact that you probably want to see who is going to sign this treaty because I suppose India is worried that uh, China is not going to sign this treaty, which is the closest uh, uh, problematic actor in, in the political picture? Am I wrong? Am I just projecting some silly ideas? No, no, I think you are, you've got it. So uh, you've been following this for so long, Emma, so <laughs> your insights are very on target. So if you look at the uh, China-Russia proposal to uh, ban the placement of any kind of weapons in space, they only include space. They do not include the capabilities and for example, anti-satellite non-kinetic capability that you can develop on the ground, right? So while you might have limitations of what you can do in space, the concern is that what happens if there is a conflict, right? And you decide that it's in your interest to use your space weapons because you have the capability, right? And because it's a norm, even if you violate it, there is no legal mechanism for any kind of uh, consequence-based approach, right? And so, yeah, it's it's uh, India's position is very much as as you pointed out. 
and since we are on the topic, uh, I would like to analyze with you, I would like to know your opinion about the India versus China relationship. How do you think that these two powers, these two, these two space powers will act in the future? They will become allies, they will remain in frosty relationship. How do you foresee this uh, complex and very important uh, relationship? Yeah, exactly as you put it, complex and very important relationship. So um, I think if I look at the history of both India and China, they had very similar ambitions when they developed their space program, right? We, of course, have to remember that China tested nuclear much ahead of India, and that's why it's a part of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So uh, both nations wanted to utilize space for their own national development. Uh, both wanted to use space for, for example, use satellite images for weather forecasting, agriculture, mapping, you know, development of e, e television, satellite television, beg your pardon. And so, which enables their own citizens, right? And the navigation capability, which they were always focusing on. I think that has been true for several other nations as well. But I think where the problem comes is because you know, when we speak about space, and this is something that I have a critique of the global space uh, community to, in a, in a, uh, I feel there is a critique that is required. So when I hear discourses, for example, in the US, especially with the uh, community-based approaches, they talk as if uh, there is no connection of space to any other medium, right? So people imagine that because space is out there, we will behave differently in space, right? My critique is that that could be true, but the problem is that most nations use space for national security and it's connected to their larger foreign policy posture and what they actually are suffering at the current moment, right? So for India, China, a collaborative approach in space is difficult because of the fact that both nations have disputed territory. Uh, they escalate at their border very frequently. Uh, Indian security personnel died in the conflict in 2020, which means it's a huge escalation. Uh, and finally, China does claim a lot of land in India, right? So 90,000 square kilometers, 36,000 uh, miles is not a joke. It's a huge amount of land that China claims as Southern Tibet, and then also some areas in Ladakh, like Aksai Chin, right? The fact that you have so many disputed territories, the fact that you're not able to come to any kind of negotiation framework and space is included in that particular comprehensive national power means, to answer your question, that a deeper collaboration is not possible when it comes to other space programs. That does not mean that China and India will not engage in economic uh, development or will have trade relations. They do. They have a very, uh, very big, as you know, uh, trade relation. I'll end by saying that one way this became clear was the fact that uh, President Xi Jinping decided not to attend the G20 summit that was hosted in India, right? So a very clear signal to India that China does not accept India as a legitimate actor. And he only sent a low-level delegation, but usually he has never skipped any G20 meeting. This was the first time, right? And also the fact that uh, he articulated a very different vision of where the world should go. And it was a snub at India because India was the president and the host of the G20 summit and thought that they had played a very good role. And space was included, by the way, in the G20 summit meeting, the science summit about collaboration. And so all this signaling tells you that China-India collaboration in space is going to be difficult. If not unimaginable, it can happen, but uh, the current uh, structure does not support it. I'd say that it's a frosty relationship at the moment. And as you say, of course, it's complicated because there are other trades deal on the table. So it's always very difficult to just merge all the needs and interests of this country, especially when we speak about two countries like China and, and India. Um, so uh, let's move to another power, India versus the US. Mm -hmm. We having a partnership, yes. Um, why now and how is this partnership gonna articulate itself? 
Yeah, sure. So if you look at India-US uh, strategic partnership, space is included within that larger comprehensive framework, right? So, and, and, and this particular relationship, as you know, historically has not been easy, right? So India has been a part of the non-aligned movement under a different government, which is the Jawaharlal Nehru government. So one thing uh, to your listeners is that when you think about India and its foreign policy posture, there is difference between who is in power, right? So like in the US, if you have a Republican administration or a democratic administration, things differ. In India, under the Congress government, and Jawaharlal Nehru was from the Congress party, non-alignment was a very big focus of India's foreign policy. And so aligning with the US or the Soviet Union was seen as to India's disadvantage. Having said that, Nehru was very impressed with Soviet plan economy because he felt that India had very similar problems. So the state has to play a very critical role in developing the economy. Now, also there were problems like US support to Pakistan during the East Pakistan crisis in 1971, where US moved the US's enterprise and nuclear capable career India has not forgotten that. There are certain historical reasons, right? But now fast forward to today. What is the situation today? That historical memory is still there. So there is a little bit of anxiety, which always comes because of the historical traumas. But I think the decision that has been taken since uh, Manmohan Singh's government, which is a Congress government, is that US-India partnership is important in the 21st century because both are major nations in the world, democratic, they use elections to form government, uh, they have a free press, and then there are also other technological capability that both nations can uh, benefit from. So in 2005, uh, George W. Bush, when he visited India, they signed the India-US nuclear deal for civilian nuclear collaboration. And now under the Modi government, the partnership is including not just space, but also quantum, artificial intelligence, all kinds of high-end technology. So, and then to end, to answer your question specifically, where is it going? So first, it is within that comprehensive strategic partnership. Second, the rise of China and the fact that China threatens a peaceful Indo-Pacific is very important for both nations. And then in terms of space, both nations have decided to collaborate actually quite deeply. Development of technology. India has now instituted an Indus mechanism for defense partnerships with the US. India has also signed agreements like the Human Spaceflight Program, where they are collaborating with NASA to develop India's human spaceflight capability. And then both nations are going to go together to the International Space Station next year for the first time. So that's a big deal. And as I mentioned before, India signed the Artemis Accord, which is actually quite interesting because India, as I mentioned, had been very wary to sign any US initiated framework. So that's a clear signal that India sees benefits both in terms of framework, as well as in terms of technology development to collaborate with the US. And regarding this US-India relationship, now that uh, Russia collaboration with the US obviously is um, broken, and it will be broken, I suppose, for another few, few years, do you think that the US might try to find in India the new um, a right arm partner, a sort of strong technological partner that they can support them, or they will try to build such a strong relationship with Europe, or maybe they already have it. I don't know. What's your position? Yeah. So if you look at uh, the International Space Station, the biggest contribution is Russia, right, with the propulsion exactly. system, and and also before SpaceX, Russia had the capability to launch astronauts to the ISS. Now, I think this particular relationship is under stress because of Russia's position, right? So people forget that it's Russia that is actually making uh, statements that they want to exit the ISS, right? And they want to exit by next 2025, but they keep pushing the date, right? Could be 2020 and 2030. And the ISS is, of course, funded up to 2030. So given that, I think, if you think about space capability development, uh, 
it takes a long time to build. So while India, now let, we have to be also realistic about India, India might not have the capability to do contribute as much as Russia does to the movement of the International Space Station. Russia has experience with its Mir station. India has never put such a big structure in space, right? And so we'll not have that kind of capability. But then what India will bring is legitimacy, right? So if Russia exists, India's participation itself will build that kind of democratic legitimacy that Russia's exit might uh, bring away from the International Space Station. And then finally, India is actually focused on building its own space station. It wants to build that kind of propulsion capability, maintaining a big structure in space. So there will be a lot of learning lesson from India joining. And also the fact that India now has the capability to go to the moon means that it should be able to develop a capability to be in low Earth orbit as well. So that's how I see my position is that India might not fill the vacuum of Russian ISS technology, but will bring legitimacy to the particular collaborative framework. And of course, as you say, it does take time to build the expertise required to, to do space. Uh, when you mention the Artemis Accord, uh, do you think that India is, as you say, kind of interesting because they've been always a bit um, edgy on signing uh, documents, but now they did it. Do you think this might be connected with what you were saying before about the interest in India in moving onto commercial uh, propositions? So the moon might be uh, interesting for them from an exploratory and commercial point of view? Yes, because as you saw in their space policy document, they are moving for commercialization. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, and India wants to, India is now going to partner with NASA for the commercial lunar payload services as well, right? So Indian private space companies are nowhere close to SpaceX or Blue Origin, for example, who are developing the lunar landers in capability. So collaborating through the Artemis Accord, building that commercial public-private partnership, also learning from the US experience as to how did it succeed in uh, motivating its own private sectors through a commercial lunar payload service, the cargo commercial crew, right? So that kind of uh, contribution is going to be extremely beneficial for India as well, as well as your question, I think you clinched it. It's also because India, and I'll say this because there are facts to support it. So if you look at the Indian Space Research Organization's press release that they put out last year, they are hoping to increase India's contribution to the $400 billion industry today, which is just based on satellite communication navigation, to about 9% in 2030. They're about 1.2% today, which is very low. And then during the G20, India's science and technology minister pointed out that India aspires to contribute about uh, from 8 billion to about 40 billion to a wow. 1 trillion space economy by 2040, right? So there are these ambitions. And then finally, when Modi uh, came back from the BRICS summit, because he was in the BRICS summit in Johannesburg when India landed on the moon, uh, his first visit was to ISRO. And in that particular visit, he pointed out that the focus of India's space program end to end, be it low Earth orbit, the moon, Mars is about commercial development of space. So your question clinched it. It is because of commercialization. And uh, Namrata, just one question out of curiosity. Do you think that India has the potential to transform this ambition in actual concrete projects? Because sometimes we have analyzed this situation. Several countries have a huge ambition but then they don't really do the groundwork to root this ambition to concrete planning and strategic thinking. Do you think India, do you think India has the, 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 the backbone structure to actually transform this ambition into concrete plans? Yeah, so if you look at uh, the India's development of its space capability, they're very practical, right? So one is that you have a uh, capability to take about 1.75 tons to space through the polar satellite launch vehicle. So which means that 
the mission was set in such a way that it is low cost, but also practical. It was not about 140 metric tons to low Earth orbit, which is China's ambition, right? India also has a medium lift rocket with the geosynchronous launch vehicle Mark III that's able to take about eight tons to low Earth orbit, much lower than the Long March 5 with 25 tons. So I'm giving you this example because India set certain goals, but they are very practical, low cost, low weight, low launch, right? And so which means that even their moon mission, the weight of the mission was such that it was much lower than Russia's Luna 25 mission, right? It was about 3,900 kg, much lower. And so you needed a less propulsion system, which is again, very practical because India does not have a heavy lift launch capability, right? Now going forward to answer your question, India now has missions that it has announced. For example, it is on its way to the Sun Earth Lagrange point. Again, a very practical mission launch on the polar satellite launch vehicle. Uh, they'll be able to achieve that, I think, because they have done simulation and to park on the Sun Earth Lagrange point, which is the equal gravitational pull of both body is difficult, but have been done before. And so India should be able to do it. Um, we'll see, but I, I give it 90% chance. There is always 10% chance of uncertainty. Of course, in space so, especially. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then Mars mission, India's already achieved uh, orbiter mission. So that again, the, the second mission is going to study the Mars atmosphere much more. So that should be able to be done. India wants to develop satellite internet through its private space entity, and they're already starting to build it. Launch capability has already been demonstrated by Vikram Skyroot Aerospace. Uh, and so I think if you look at India's ambitions, uh, they are about collaboration with Japan and the US particularly. Again, very practical missions. India already has demonstrated landing on the moon. So India obviously will contribute to Artemis partners. Uh, by the way, in today's context, none of the Artemis signatory nations have the capability to land on the moon, not even the US, right? It had it during the Apollo era, but not today. They're still trying to do it, but they're behind schedule. And so we'll have to wait and see. And Japan will try to land in four months. So, I mean, India should be able to meet its ambition. Venus mission, the human spaceflight mission called Gaganyan, they are collaborating with the US now. So that should lead to further development of capability. In fact, it's a strategic decision they have taken to collaborate. So uh, it's ecosystem, the funding, the way they are enabling their private space sector, I see India succeeding, but it will take time, Emma. India's space program is slow uh, in terms of development because it is indigenous capability. And so it might take another 10 years, but they will get there. Fantastic. Thank you, Namrat. So there is strategy. There is a strategy. There is a structure. It's not just ambition without uh, substance. Uh, fantastic. I think I'm going to really see there are several questions in our panel. So I will say I'm going to uh, pass the talking stick to our guest. And the um, first question is um, AC, I'm not understanding, is it a question? Could you reformulate it in a question matter so I know what to ask Namrata? So I'm going to just skip it for a second and then I will answer it. It's just it. a statement. Ah, it's a statement, sorry. So just sending his condolences to the uh, apparent end to the successful Shanrian 3 mission after the lunar night. Okay. So that's okay. it. So. Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. So I thought maybe I'm not understanding the question. Uh, Christoph, Christoph, thank you for mentioning the BRICS because uh, um, I wanted to ask the same question. Um, since President Modi proposed to create a BRICS++ space ex exploration organization, to which extent would that reshape the currently imposed dichotomy of Artemis versus ILRS, such as US versus China, and allow more options to participants? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so when Modi announced that, it was interesting because uh, he had just signed the Artemis Accords, right? So I think the BRICS conceptualization of space is about developing capability like space exploration, missions to low Earth orbit, 
developing capability for Earth observation, including addressing issues like climate change. So there is really no convergence as to the missions, right? With the US, India is signed on to human space flight, signed on to lunar missions uh, and planetary defense. I completely forgot to mention this to you. So in the latest joint statement that came out of the G20, what was absolutely astounding to me was that India and the US are now collaborating in developing capability to deflect an asteroid which they call planetary defense, which means both nations who are nuclear nations can develop nuclear technology to do this. We don't know, but that's one of the technology that NASA talks about. Now, in terms of the BRICS, so I don't see that kind of tension. Now, the interesting point is, if you think about India's presence in the BRICS, uh, it occurred much before the current uh, strategic convergence, I wouldn't use the word alignment, but partnership with the US. India is not an ally of the US like NATO allies. And so uh, India's presence in the BRICS creates an inf inform influence power capability that is not devoid of being able to have conversations with China and Russia, right? So it is really critical if you want to talk about concepts like space debris management, space traffic management, consensus on uh, what is close approach for satellite without talking to China and Russia, who has enormous amount of satellites and anti-satellite weapon capability, you will not get nowhere, right? So the fact that BRICS has the ability to dialogue these issue is really critical. And so I think while we see the grouping as trying to build capability to bring other nations together, China, Russia actually got some other nations to join, as you know, right? And so it's a way and a mechanism to create a dialogue. Should it be seen as against the US? Uh, it appears like that, right? Because China, Russia are part of it. But then I would argue that India also sees itself as a leading actor and wants to play a role where it has multiple alignments, sometimes to its disadvantage because nations do not trust nations that have so many multi-alignments, right? But it can also be an advantage, right? So uh, in terms of creating, uh, for example, the G20 joint statement was very interesting because there was consensus. Uh, despite the fact that Ukraine was very critical, uh, it was important to have some level of understanding of where the nations are going. I'll finally end by saying that during the BRICS summit, and this is a great question, Christoph, because during the BRICS summit, South Africa signed the International Lunar Research Station with China. So very clearly uh, deciding to join the China-led legal mechanism to utilize the moon, did not join Artemis, right? Unlike Rwanda that has. And so, and India that has. Uh, and so that's a very interesting departure. And so you still see this clear uh, positioning at BRICS as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question by Kesha Perma. Uh, greetings, Namrata. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. <laughs> uh, my question is, in recent years, we have witnessed the emergence of several spacefaring nations leading to intensified competition among them. In such competitive environment, can Indian space diplomacy flourish? And how can it address challenges related to securing resources and security concerns? Yeah, so it's a difficult question to answer. And so I'm glad you asked it. Um, it challenges my own thinking at times, because if you look at India's positioning, uh, it's clearly batting on the US side, right? As, as of today, it, it's becoming very clear, uh, including a closer and closer defense relationship. So uh, the fact that uh, China and Russia, especially China, has a very different narrative on space. Uh, the fact that uh, China wants to become the lead actor in space by 2049 and very advanced in terms of its capability. Uh, and the fact that both India and China have disputed borders, India's ability to use its uh, space diplomacy with a country like China is limited. Right, you have to be realistic. It cannot uh, think that it has the influence and power to change China's narrative and perspective, especially the Communist Party of China that is very nationalistic and very clear in terms of its goal. And then finally, 
Pakistan, right? And these two nations, China and Pakistan, are key for India because they are nuclear weapon states and borders India and has disputed territory with India. Pakistan now wants to join the China-led International Lunar Station and wants to have its own satellite capability. So when you talk about nations like that, India's diplomacy has its limits. Now, Russia is a very interesting case study, right? Uh, India has had a very good relationship with the Soviet Union, including with Russia. Today, India has India has collaborated with Russia in regard to space. In fact, Indian astronauts trained in the Yuri Gagarin Ast Cosmonaut Training Center before India decided that it will now send its astronaut to the Johnson Space Center. You see that now divergence, right, even from Russia. And I think the China-Russia relationship, the fact that they have signed the joint statement is informing India's decision as well, that there are consequences when you uh, move to another side. Now, when it comes to space diplomacy by itself, and I'll end there, without taking into account this, uh, keeping these difficult relationships in mind, but looking at India's capability at the UN and building space diplomacy. India has used its space diplomacy in South Asia, for example, launching the South Asia satellite that offers uh, communication, navigation to South Asian countries, except Pakistan. Uh, India is very uh, powerful in its influence at the level of the United Nations, for example, building space governance mechanisms. Its abstentions are clearly noticed, right? And so there it is, space diplomacy comes in. India tries to bring the perspective of the global South and developing nations. And so diplomacy at that level does have influence for India. Thank you. And we have Art Cotterell from Australia. Art, thank you very much for being here with us. And he's asking you about what are your views on the increasing or future collaboration between India and uh, uh, Australia? Space appears to be an area where the two countries are seeking to strengthen international cooperation and encourage commercial investment. Very good question, Art. Yeah, yeah. And Australia is a key actor, uh, as you know, within the quadrilateral security dialogue, right? So where space is a very critical component of cooperation. So Australia is also a signatory to the Artemis Accords. And so, which means that there will be this now multilateral collaboration that includes Australia and India and Japan, who are quadrilateral security partners as well. India and Australia has possibilities of collaborating for their moon mission, for example. Australia has a mission to the moon, building satellite capability together for space debris management, space traffic management. But having said that, there is a divergence. So while India has taken the strategic decision to invest in space as a key priority of its uh, internal and international development, the current Australian government has actually decreased funding for space and has not made space a critical factor into its foreign policy, as well as the development of its commercial space activity. As you know, there are a lot of complaints from Australian private sector that the current government is not supportive of commercial development of space, whereas India is going on the completely opposite path, right? India has established a space policy that is completely prioritizing the commercial development of space, including the private space actors creating regulation to support them. Australia is kind of moving backward. And so given that, there could be difficulties in the relationship because there is a divergence in policy shift. Now, as we know, things change. So maybe Australia will change its perspective and recommit to space development again. But that is not the case today. I love, as you know, every space policy under the sun of any, <laughs> any country. It doesn't matter. Just pick a country out of the package. We'll be like, I know it. I've read it. Fantastic. Uh, Nami, I'm going to close with the, the final question by Christophe, who is going to poke you uh, on a more, uh, let's say, overview broad question. She says, you wrote about India's two strengths, cost competitiveness in space development and diplomatic leverage based on strong leadership. May we expect a strong India welcoming other countries under its space exploration umbrella in a foreseeable future, which I might suppose it means uh, Christophe is asking if we should expect uh, India start to lead uh, in, in the space sector. W what do you think? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I think we will see that happening. 
right? So India is already starting to say that it's a leading actor. So what is interesting from the Indian perception of itself, especially under the Modi government, and which has been articulated by the external affairs minister Jay Shankar in his book, The India Way, that India does not see itself as a great power. You know, the two countries that it sees as great powers in with one it has to engage, which is the United States, and with one where it has to compete, which is China, right? So it's a very clear framing. So what the argument is that Given that framing of great power presence, India is a leading actor, and so India will establish mechanisms that will include more and more nations in space exploration. Uh, the Indian Prime Minister in his speech right after the Chandrayaan-3 said that the data from Chandrayaan-3 is going to be shared with the world, right? So scientific contribution of space development. And then finally, uh, where leadership really matters is that during the G20 summit, India took the initiative and succeeded in including the African Union as a permanent member of the G20. And that includes the African Space Agency, right? Which means that India is starting to take leadership in terms of including nations and emerging nations into its conceptualization of what space should be and where space development should go, which includes uh, understanding uh, the presence of space resources, and sharing the data with other nations. So India is starting to take that lead today. Fantastic. And Amrata, as usual, it's been incredible. We filled up all the hour. The questions are fantastic. You've been over-prepared, as you over my expectation as usual. Thank you very much. Allow me, before I pass the word to Torsen, to thank you for being here with us, to remind our guests, our audience, that the next episode, number six, is going to be about the Middle East, and it's going to be in a couple of months' time. So probably mid of November. We have not fixed the date yet, but we will decide it soon. And this is going to be six out of seven. So we're getting at the end of our a journey, so don't miss out uh, the next episode. Thank you very much also to everyone that's been listening to us for the fantastic question, for the people on LinkedIn following us, and of course to Torsen being our uh, director of uh, the entire operation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Space Watch Global, as usual. And I think over to Torsen for reminding you our next uh, appointment and dates. Thank you very much. Um... No, but uh, thank you very much, Emma. Thank you very much, uh, Namrata. It was was wonderful uh, to to listen, and uh, we also got very positive feedback on on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, just one thing to to challenge you, uh, Namrata. Germany recently signed the Artemis Accords, as you as you know, but today Germany made another step. We just released our space strategy. So potentially a strategy you haven't seen before um yeah it, but uh and i only have seen the, the german version so as uh, as soon as i get hold of an english version i'm happy to send it over you will raise to the challenge absolutely yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. oh, I, would, I would really i would re i'm looking forward to reading that uh please do send it to me when they have an english translation yeah um i mean i, I translated today around um, the the press release uh on on chat gpt which was fine enough but i'm um, happy to send it over to you and it will be up tomorrow on space watch global in our new section so before we say goodbye we would like to remind you of our upcoming events and this week is very full we have every day um something that come comes up tomorrow on the 28th or on thursday at 4 pm we have our next space cafe banalux by the wonderful heike ponyan and she will talk with the head of space at the Belgian defense, Major Nicolas Jerome. So I'm looking forward to that very, very much. In the evening, tomorrow um, at 8 p.m., um, there will be the next Space Bar by Astro Agency, where we have the honor to provide the news section. And then on Friday, we close this week with our next Space Cafe Scotland by Angela Matisse. And the topics couldn't be more diverse than that. She will talk with Dennis Bettis Susan. He is a space insurer and this seemed enabling and protecting satellite services, the ultimate insurance frontier. So we can do whatever we want to do in commercial space. If we can't find someone who insures us, then it's an Wabang game. So 
Um, then in October, we will be mainly on the road. Uh, Emma will be in Germany, in Munich at Aurora Tech's Fire Conference on the 2nd and give a keynote there. I will be in Andoya um, at the Strategic Framework event. And then or a week later, I will be in Berlin at the Intergeo. Then on the 17th, we plan our next Space Cafe 33 Minutes with the Estonian leader, Paul Liers. And then on the 18th, we have the German Space Congress uh, in Berlin. And then we will be a week after in, in Oslo again at the Spaceport Norway. Um, please find all these events uh, and subscribe to, to them on Eventbrite. As always, we would like to hear your feedback. Please check in with us on Twitter, on Facebook and LinkedIn. For those of from the newer generation, Twitter is what you call now X, but it sounds so strange still. However, don't forget to sign into our daily on bi-weekly newsletters. And if you want to support um, even more events like that one, Go treat yourself with something special and become a space watcher today or help us in the supporter program. Thank you all very much for your interest today. Thank you, Emma, for hosting this inspiring talk. And thank you, um, Namrata, for your incredible deep knowledge uh, about it. And I mean, India is obviously your home turf, but it's so fundamental and, and so great. You you navigate in this geopolitical uh slippery road uh, in an in an absolute fantastic way so the audience thank you very much for joining us hope to see you tomorrow in or in our next events in the meantime visit our website or follow us on social media and don't forget become a space watcher thank you very much thank, thank you bye